Okay, here we go. Uh, this is part two of um, In the Beginning, our week one Wednesday lecture. Um, we're going to move beyond the introduction and into chapter one. Uh, you don't really have to read carefully uh, the introduction, but it is helpful. Um, it does describe, for example, the origin of, of the name um, Britannia, of Britain, where it comes from. And it talks about uh, the Celtic people. I'm going to use a blue marker here to emphasize the things I add onto the board here. But I, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't use the word Britain to describe the Celtic people that lived uh, in the British Isles uh, because it's confusing. Right, but they were called the Britons. So occasionally I will do that, but let's let's uh, define our terms carefully here. All right, um, there's a there's a geographical place called the British Isles, <clears throat> and the British Isles include, uh, you know, the United Kingdom and its regions, as we talked before, including Northern Ireland, which is on a separate uh, island. Right, the northern part of Ireland, but Ireland. Ireland is part of the British Isles, but of course it's not a part of Britain. It was a part of the British Empire, but it gained independence. And of course, before, uh, hundreds of years ago, it was independent as well. So Ireland is included in the British Isles, but don't make the mistake of thinking that Ireland is part of British culture or um, the British political entity, because uh, an Irish person would not uh, appreciate that. They would resent it. Um, again, Europeans are very aware of this, but perhaps uh, Asian people are less so. Um, <clears throat> so there's, there's Britannia, which is a Roman province. There's the, the people which had their own names for themselves, but the Romans called them Britons. Um, and then there's the modern um, political entity, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, right? Um, so those are all different things, and uh, I am going to talk. I'm going to be talking about primarily. I'm going to be talking about England, but I am going to refer to um, Welsh, the people from Wales, and the Scottish, who had their and these people had their own kingdoms, their own territory, but um, they all eventually uh, formed uh, by force or by agreement um, <clears throat> a one nation called the United Kingdom, okay? It, it's, it's not, I'm not going to uh, test you on what each of these terms mean, but it, you do need to keep them, you have to be aware that they mean uh, different things, okay? Um, so as you go through the introduction, I do talk about that, so read that part. And there's, there's a few sort of funny examples of, um, you know, comedy related to uh, British history, I don't recommend watching Monty Python uh, until you finish this course. There is a reference there to a scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, but if you're, you're not familiar with British culture, it won't be funny at all. And even if you are, um, to be honest, you have to have a certain sense of humor, which it involve, it's kind of intellectual, satirical, um, mocking version of of history right they're making they're making fun of their own history and they're very good at it um, but it's really old it's from the 1970s so you being used to YouTube and TikTok and Instagram uh, and short videos and really high quality graphics you might not like it at all but it's in there anyway and the reason it's in there <clears throat> is because it's making fun of uh, the whole feudal uh, dynamic, right? Um, how people, modern people, look back to you know the medieval period where there's kings and queens and peasants, uh, and and some some there's some sort of idealized you know perspective on that period, like like it was <clears throat> you know um, a bunch of knights um, galloping around on horses, saving princesses. Um, in castles and it, it, you know it was some sort of romantic um, you know uh, fantasy land where in reality it was a, a pretty brutal existence and it was a struggle for survival 
um, a daily struggle for survival. But we'll we'll get to all that later. So I do go into more detail about identity and definitions of culture and stuff. But I've lectured on that enough. So you know, read the introduction um, to get more examples and more explanation of what I'm talking about. I put some funny things in there too, like you know. Uh, I think there's a picture of um, an English style breakfast, like bangers and mash. Um, <clears throat> I love that food, but to people who are not used to it or maybe don't have um, a lot of British uh, English cooking in their family, going back, you might think that looks a little bit disgusting. It's a, it's a bunch of beans and, and some toast eggs and sausages, right? Um, American breakfast isn't that much different. And then, of course, there's a cup of tea. Um, so these are just stereotypes, really. And <clears throat> we are gonna talk about stereotypes. Um, stereotypes, obviously, can be very negative. They can be discriminatory. Um, they can lead to prejudice and misunderstanding. Um, but of course, there are positive stereotypes, too. And we use them, right? When, when you go to a country, you just got to learn some general stuff about the country and, and it's helpful. Um, but once you get to know the country better, you don't need those stereotypes anymore, right? And <clears throat> if you rely on stereotypes um, in individual cases, uh, you can get in, you can make mistakes and you can offend people. So you have to be careful of that. Uh, there's a beautiful picture uh, taken by NASA, of course, on page 43, which shows you um, what it looks like from space. Uh, you never get that. Uh, most of us haven't been to space, so you never get to see what it looks like, except for on a map. But um, I find this is just a, a beautiful picture. Uh, it happened to be a day where there wasn't a cloud in the sky above uh, the entire British Isles. So you can see the, the whole thing and its shape uh, exactly as it appears. Um, if you were in orbit. So that it's a pretty cool picture there on page 43. And then there's a, a map of all the, um, the whole United Kingdom divided by its regions, which are called counties and shires. County is a, derived from a French word and shire is uh, derived from an Anglo-Saxon um, word. So we're gonna talk about all the cultures and how they mix together uh, over the next couple weeks. That's one of the major features is there's invasions that occur uh, and mixing of cultures and uh, the English language develops by the contributions. The, the backbone of English is Germanic. Um, that's why our German students have such nice pronunciation um, because the pronunciation is closer and some of the vocabulary overlaps, but there's a huge infusion of French vocabulary into English. Um, and there, there's Viking words uh, and, well, there's words from all over the place, but in the first millennium, um, it's, it's primarily the, the cultures that invade, the, the people that invade the country and settle there that contribute to the, the creation of Old English, which evolves into Middle English, uh, and then into Early Modern English, and finally into um, the Englishes that we have now, American English, um, British English, Australian, Canadian, and so on. So um, <clears throat> that's what, another reason why we talk about this ancient history stuff, because um, you can see that the sort of fingerprint of <clears throat> various cultures, European cultures on England, uh, as they invade and settle and are, are amalgamated into what eventually becomes a British identity. What I'm talking about right now as I begin this lecture, <clears throat> um, when I get to the people that live there, I'm talking about a Celtic culture. Um, but we'll get, before I do that, let me, let me talk about, um, I'm gonna go through this methodically. Um, let's talk about what uh, Britain, how Britain was formed, okay? So <clears throat> if you really wanna go back to the original British people, you're gonna have to go back to the last ice age about 12,000, 13,000 years ago, where it was actually possible to walk across, because there's a very short distance. This is a, a fundamental aspect of British culture, because 
France is so close that you can see it. And we have a French student, so maybe she has <clears throat> gone to Calais or, or seen the white cliffs of Dover. So on a clear day, uh, it's about 20, 25 kilometers away. Uh, famous people have actually um, swam across the English Channel. It's called English Channel. It's, it's very narrow and it, it has a significant role, not only because it's proximity and um, people in Northern France, Northwestern France from uh, Brittany and Normandy are very close, um, but also the fact that there is a water, there is water separating them, even though it's narrow, it, it is something that you have to get across. It is a barrier. Um, but, but it is also so close that there's constant, you know, when things are, what can say, when, when relations are good, um, it's very easy to trade, right? So, you know, <clears throat> trading between the continent, especially um, France and, you know, the, the territories before France was, a, was an entire kingdom, especially Western France like Aquitaine and Burgundy and Brittany, the Western French provinces and, and kingdoms, um, they had very important economic relationships with um, Great Britain. So <clears throat> historically, the most important uh, influence on English culture, British culture, uh, is French culture. Um, <clears throat> there's also though, to, uh, in, in a much more difficult journey across the North Sea, are the Viking countries, so which former what we call Scandinavia. There's there's uh, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, which are also fairly close, along with um, the Netherlands uh, and Belgium. All of those coastlines. Germany's there, but um, really just Saxony um, is close enough, um, and it, it's it's a much more difficult journey than to kind of quickly get across the channel. But the the channel is notorious for having bad weather and not just bad weather, but it, it looks like it's fine and then it gets foggy and you can't see. Um, so you start to get ready to go across and then all of a sudden there's fog um, or there's a storm or the wind changes and it blows the wrong way. You'll see how often this happens is that when people, especially if it's some sort of invasion, they try to sail across to England and then the wind blows them back to where they're coming from. Because at that point, everybody is using wind, right? They're, they're sailboats. So if you don't have wind, you can't, if the wind isn't blowing the right way, you, you can't get across. So sometimes the wind blows up the channel and sometimes it blows down. And sometimes there's a storm. Sometimes it looks like it's a sunny day and all of a sudden a storm comes out of nowhere. So this is, makes it tricky, even though it's very close um, to get across the channel. So sometimes it's like a barrier, like protection from being attacked, sometimes. But also, water is the main way of transporting. You can, you can move an army and you can transport goods um, on water. Still today, the, the best way to move a lot of stuff is on the water. But uh, in the time period we're talking about, thousands of years ago, it, it really was the only way. <clears throat> right? You either, you carry something on your back, you have a, an ox and a cart or, or a horse, or you have a ship or, or a, like not a big ship, but a ship. But you know, you can carry uh, on a ship a hundred times or a thousand times more stuff um, faster than you can do it on foot or with a domesticated animal like a horse or an ox. Um, so the water is essential, especially water that uh, is, <clears throat> you know, calm and easily navigable, right? That's why the Mediterranean was so important. The Mediterranean that separates Africa and Europe is notoriously um, calm and, and not nearly as deep and dangerous as the ocean. <clears throat> so the North Sea and the ocean, for the English, going through the sea was sometimes very dangerous, even if you're just trying to get to France. So lots of people died at sea. But um, in the beginning, <clears throat> uh, they didn't even have boats at, at, in the beginning. They, they literally had to walk across. And as the ice melted, 
people migrated across and there was a kind of waterfall that eventually uh, formed. The English Channel was actually, you could actually walk across and then over thousands of years as the ice melted, it, it um, filled up the channel and it became, um, you, you couldn't walk anymore, you'd have to use a boat, right? So that's, that's how the geography and the relationship between the island and the continent started. Um, <clears throat> the climate of England <clears throat> is quite mild. Um, it snows occasionally, but because of the water <clears throat> that comes from Mexico, there's a, what we call the Gulf Stream, um, the warm water in the Gulf of Mexico near Florida and, and uh, southern United States, it crosses the Atlantic and it, it um, brings warm water and moderate weather all the way across to Portugal, Spain, Western France and England, which this moderates the climate of England. So even though England um, is at the same latitude of, you know, the of Ontario and Newfoundland in Canada, where we have very cold winters, where it's minus 20 and we get buried in snow, <clears throat> right? Even though the latitude is the same, the climate's completely different. Um, this is due to the Gulf Stream. Now, on the other hand, uh, Scotland and uh, the East Coast, the Northeast Coast, especially Scotland, but Northern England facing Scandinavia, the North Sea is connected to the Arctic and there's no Gulf Stream or warm weather, warm water, moderating the climate there. So in Northern Scotland, it's very cold. So there's a big contrast between the warm, moderate, mild climate uh, and, and the, the sort of rolling hills and more fertile land, which is better for growing food in the south of the British Isles compared to the north where it's rocky and cold and and um, extreme, right? So naturally, the people who live in Scotland, they didn't have as much food, their population is much smaller, they have less resources and less wealth, it's harder to build roads, they had to, you know, raise goats and sheep and live sort of, um, you know, not a nomadic, a, a shepherd kind of lifestyle, right? A herdsman lifestyle, whereas in Southern England, they started to develop um, you know, agriculture, larger farms and growing wheat and corn and not corn because I shouldn't say corn. Corn is, does, doesn't come over until after Columbus. There's no corn, uh, but they grow grain, barley and wheat and other um, <clears throat> necessary crops. There's no potatoes and there's no corn. We have to talk about this later because those are actually uh, American plants that that were not brought over until post Columbus um, but they grew a lot of food and they were wealthier and they had better weather <clears throat> and they had more resources so the population of England has always been much larger than Scotland um, Ireland also is much more fertile the population of Ireland is small now but that's mostly because of socio-economic and political and historical um, events, not because Ireland can't produce a lot of food, it can. Okay, so <clears throat> yes, I told you already, it's an island. Um, they have a very, very strong relationship with Europe, but it's kind of, as uh, our European students remarked already, it's a little bit complicated. Sometimes it's like competition, sometimes it's admiration, sometimes it's jealousy, sometimes it's you know, um, violent or, or um, aggressive, right? So they had, there's always this tension. And, and I don't think English people, I mean, there's every, every British and English person's different, but they consider themselves not quite European, right? You, we as outsiders can call them European. I even say, like, I'm aware of this. So when somebody says, have you been to Europe? I say no, but I've been to London. Um, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Am I supposed to say yes or no? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but there's tension there about the identity. But one of the things is that helps the British identify themselves is by saying what they're not. They sometimes say, we are not European. That's what makes us British. 
And similarly, the French have done the same thing. What are we? We're French because we're not German uh, and we're not Spanish and we're not English. We are French. It helps you define your identity by saying what you aren't, okay? So that's part of, that's part of what the British think about themselves. <clears throat> um, what else? Oh, the rivers. There's a lot of rivers uh, in, in England and they're very important. Uh, the Thames is the river, the, the famous river in London. Obviously that's where uh, London was built and the reason it was built there is because of that river because you could bring, um, you could trade and you could transport things easily on the river and that's where the Romans built the city of Londinium because um, it was an ideal spot, right? Um, they did it because uh, Rome was built on the Tiber, um, Paris is on the Seine and uh, um, Seoul is on the Han River, right? In, in thousands of years ago, large cities were always placed um, in ideal positions on large rivers that had access. So there's also other rivers though. There's the Tweed and the Humber. So the largest cities in England, and they, weren't very, they were very small except for London for most of um, English history. They're, they're placed mostly along the coast facing, facing Europe where uh, the rivers, the cities have rivers that access the ocean. This is a very good thing for trade, but later it's gonna be kind of a disadvantage because it also means that, for example, Vikings can come up the rivers on their ships and attack the city. Uh, so the rivers were essential to the development of um, towns, villages, and eventually cities in England. Um, it is an Atlantic nation, and that's not important in ancient Britain, but going into the modern era when the age of exploration um, starts and Europeans start building ships that can handle the ocean and they, they can go across the ocean and, 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 you know, step by step get closer and closer to going all the way around the world eventually, the position of being on the West um, and having access, direct access to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, those Atlantic nations, Portugal, Spain, and France, and uh, the, the British, they have a big advantage, and the Dutch too, they have a big advantage because they, they can go directly into the ocean as opposed to the other, um, you know, powerful countries, powerful kingdoms at the time, Italy, Germany, uh, Poland, um, you know, the, the Czech Republic, um, Austria, they, they don't have ports on the Atlantic that allow them to easily send ships out into the ocean um, to colonies. So <clears throat> eventually this will become a huge problem. Um, Germany and other uh, powerful countries, including Russia, are going to be looking for access to the ocean and th this will become a, a big point of a contention between the Atlantic nations and the ones that are not on the Atlantic. Um, okay, <clears throat> so I, I, after thousands of years of people living there, um, the, the, the people living in Britain, the Britons, the, the Celtic culture <clears throat> that is there, they start to develop towns and tools and everything just like everybody else. And they are trading and connected um, to Belgia and the Gauls who live in, in uh, France and Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, so they are trading and they are getting technology and they're, they're building um, increasingly complicated communities. Uh, but they are behind, right? They're always behind. Um, we think of the United Kingdom and British culture as being sort of advanced, right? Their first industrial revolution, they're the first to industrialize. They started the Industrial Revolution. Um, they were, you know, participated in the Age of Exploration. They have lots of famous scientists, Isaac Newton being one of the greatest. You think of all these things, innovative, you know, ahead, advanced, powerful. No, they, that's not what it was like. Thousands of years ago, it was in the corner of a gigantic system of continents. You got China and India and Asia, you got African empires and you have Egypt and you have 
you have all of these, you know, Europe is itself behind, except for the Roman Empire, is behind um, the Asian empires and some of the African empires, right? And when the Roman Empire collapses and the, you know, Islam, the Muslim Empire expands and takes over North Africa all the way to China, you know, Europe is uh, backwater. They're, they're not an important part of the world. And the least important part of that unimportant part of the world is England. So it's the least likely, in some sense, um, what happened uh, later and the British Empire being the most powerful um, nation, most powerful um, country in the world, it is a very unlikely thing. If you think about any sort of scenario, right? But it, it was the underdog, it was not an important place. But certain things happened, as we will talk about. Uh, it has certain advantages, uh, and certain things happened that enabled them to become uh, the most powerful uh, country in the world. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, at this point, technolo technologically, politically, culturally less developed, okay? I'm not saying they didn't have a great culture. It, they're just behind in some ways, right? <clears throat> so um, one of the things, if you wanna go and see, there's a, Skara Bray is a very famous, sort of 5,000 year old kind of um, village in Scotland, uh, right in the North Scotland. And there were people living there and they basically dug their village out of the ground near the coast and it's been excavated um, and you can walk around it uh, and everything. And, it, and there's some similarities between uh, it and, and Viking settlements that are thousands of years uh, more recent. So you can see basically a, a prototype of what a Viking settlement would look like, you know, in 700, 800 AD uh, when you go to Scarra Bray. And, and the name itself, like Northern Scotland has a very, very strong um, Scandinavian uh, influence. So it's a very cool place to see because <clears throat> you can really see, even today, um, all the traditions um, and, and, and uh, the, you know, the layout of the cities and the, the culture that is Scottish Viking, Scottish Norwegian, or Scottish Norse, if you want to call it that. A very cool place. Um, like I said, um, the Celtic culture uh, was a huge sort of pan-European culture that all of Northern Europe was sort of related. Um, the languages were different, but, but the culture had some common elements and, and Britain was part of that. So the, the strongest um, group of Celtic people were the Gauls, which was basically um, most of France, right? But there were many different tribes. Um, these Celtic people, uh, had lived all over Northern Europe. Some of them are Germanic. Um, we usually distinguish between Germanic and Gaul, uh, so, sorry, Celtic and, and Germanic, but there are some connections there too. But basically, you know, anything, um, anything towards Germany uh, would have been a Germanic tribe. That's German, it's, these words all come from, from Roman I, um, terms, right? Um, <clears throat> The, the, the Germans, of course, call themselves um, Deutsch. Um, we call them German because the, the Romans called it Germania, and so we call them Germans, but um, the French call them Almania. Almania is the name of a, of a Germanic tribe, the, the Almani. The Almani, Germania was the... So these names all come from ancient terms. Some of them are from... Um, Latin, some of them are from, um, <clears throat> some of them are from German, some of them are from um, Celtic words, right? As, as I said, Belgie, Belgie is actually the Korean word for Belgium, but that's actually, it's called Belgie in Korean because um, Belgium is not the name of the tribe. Uh, the name of the tribe, the, the Celtic tribe was Belgie. So the Belgie, they were close, they were a big problem for the Romans eventually because they were very close to um, Northern Gaul and to the Britons. So they, they had a relationship there. 
Um, so this Celtic, there's features of these Celtic people. They were tribal. There wasn't like an emperor or a king of the whole uh, Celtic, you know, culture. They were just had similar cultural um, similarities, like the way that they dressed, um, the way that they organized them, linguistic um, relations, appearances, right? The way that they dressed and stuff, they tended to have, sometimes they had face paint on, um, the way that they hunted, <clears throat> um, the way that they designed their villages, the way that they organized their societies. Um, they, they, um, they didn't write things down for the most part. Um, they, they prized certain cultural objects. Uh, they didn't have cities and roads and aqueducts. Uh, they didn't have council chambers and buildings uh, the way that the Romans did. So the Romans considered them, as you may imagine, backwards, savages, uncivilized. Um, and for that reason, among other reasons, they wanted to conquer them and, and, and they wanted their territory and their resources, but they also considered them dangerous. They considered Celtic people wild, strange, dangerous. They were very good warriors. They were very brave and they were very independent. And the, the Romans had been attacked by them, by various tribes many times. And so Julius Caesar went into Gaul on a mission to subdue Gaul forever, which he did. Okay. So <clears throat> the Celtic, the, the Celtic culture was, um, suppressed dominated, conquered, uh, and altered forever in Europe. Um, it survived most in the British Isles through what now is now Ireland. Ireland is a, is a Celtic. It is probably the, the place to go if you wanna see um, Celtic traditions and you want to um, hear Irish language, which is descended from, from Celtic language, Gaelic. Um, Scotland and Wales and Ireland have retained a lot of elements of Celtic culture. Um, England became um, Anglicized by the Germans and it became Romanized by the Romans. But um, the fringes of the British Isles, the edges, the frontier, retained as, for, for many hundreds of years, in some cases, over a thousand years, retained their language, their independence, and their Celtic culture. So the people that lived in Britain, we, we will call them the original people, the original cultures, the inhabitants that were there, they will be called Celtic, okay? So this is the starting point of British culture, is the root of it is Celtic, okay? So they, they've got a tribal system, they look different, than Romans. Romans are, you know, from the Italian peninsula. Generally, they have darker hair, they're shorter. Um, there's various appearances, but generally Celtic people are taller and have various um, light colored hair, lighter colored skin. They're quite hairy, um, sort of like me, if I didn't cut my hair for a few years and I put some tattoos on, um, pierced myself, and maybe I carried around a head of somebody I killed just to make people scared of me. Um, and I was really individualistic. Um, <clears throat> probably I would have, you know, um, a little bit more, there's less of a hierarchy. Um, what I mean is my wife and I would have more of a balanced relationship in terms of who as the, the, the authority and the family. And the same thing in the tribe. Women would have like a stronger, more, uh, not perfectly equal, but like a, a more, a stronger, role um, and Germanic tribes were like that too that um, women were, were given more respect and they were tough and they often they knew how to fight and um, they uh, in Roman culture um, in Latin culture and in the Roman Empire the the father the patriarch had absolute authority literally had the power of life or death over his family and his especially the woman and his daughters um, the absolute authority in the family and in society in general um, was it was a it was a society ruled by men, whereas the the role 
in politics, the role in the family, the role in even in in some cases in combat, um, the 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 Celtic people and the Germanic people, um, women were treated as um, equal, not equals, but uh, with they had a lot more power within their society. <clears throat> I don't want to exaggerate uh, and say that it was equal and they. They, you know, king, they still had kings uh, and queens were very uncommon, but we will get, I will talk about Queen Boudicca later, and she's a Celtic queen who fought against the Romans. We're not going to talk about her today, but she's a perfect example of the possibility of a woman being um, <clears throat> in control and being respected and being the leader and having the authority uh, in a Celtic culture, where in Roman culture that was almost... It happened occasionally, but when it happened, it, there was a mass sort of resistance amongst all people that this is unnatural, right? They always thought, okay, if we're being led by a woman, this, this is something bad's gonna happen. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Um, Cleopatra is the perfect example of that. She was the queen of Egypt. She was both a foreigner, uh, Julius Caesar's consort's wife, um, but the, the Roman in Egypt, it was fine that she was the queen and she was the leader of the Egyptians, but in Rome, they rejected it. And then they, they thought literally that she was gonna destroy the emperor, uh, empire because it was bad luck. It, it was wrong to have a, a foreign woman um, be in that position of power, okay? So all these things, these don't really sound like negative things necessarily, right? Uh, they have their own religion which is mostly sort of a, a pagan religion related to nature. They had these people called druids and they erected these henges where they, they, they moved these gigantic stones and set them up. And they had these people with special training and special powers who were able to communicate with the spirits. And they, had, they didn't really have an organized religion, but there was communication between druids of different areas. And sometimes they had, you know, council meetings where um, important druids from across, you know, Celtic, you know, regions would gather together and have a meeting. Uh, they cared about the seasons, you know, winter solstice, summer, when the passage of the seasons and certain days were very important. Um, like I said, winter solstice, summer solstice, um, they had harvest, you know, dates and they, and they celebrated and made sacrifices and, and they were, they were leaders of the community. So no Christianity or Islam or anything, no, no Greek pantheons or stuff. They had these people, Koreans might think of them uh, like a mudang, kind of, not exactly the same, but kind of, um, somebody who is in touch with nature, um, with spirits and the natural world. Um, and they were the leaders of the community often, and they were, you know, part medicine man, part spiritual leader, part counselor, part educator, part wise. They had a, a multiple functions in the community. <clears throat> and uh, of course they had their own language which um, the, descent, the descendants of Celtic, as I said, are Scottish, Irish, and Welsh. <clears throat> okay, that pretty much sums up my intro basic introduction. This material you need to know um, for the quiz. And I'm gonna stop here with um, 55 BC, Julius Caesar finally <clears throat> subdues the Gauls, wins the war, conquers, um, France, which will become France, but it's called Gaul, and he discovers that um, there's still resistance uh, in Gaul, and that he suspects that there are Celtics in Britain, across the channel, um, providing, helping them, giving them resources, food, weapons, um, possibly even fighting, like sending sending warriors over to fight against him. So he crosses the channel um, to teach them a lesson, to make contact and to teach them a lesson. Um, and he, he you know, engages them and then comes back and then he goes again, but he doesn't conquer it. He just makes a point like, we can come over here. If you interfere in Gaul, we're gonna send a huge army with a lot of ships and weapons and, and we're going to destroy you know your your uh, community so 
that he he does that for that reason, but he also does it because literally <clears throat> um, the British Isles are sort of a mythological, legendary place. There are Greeks and Romans that have written about this island that's off, you know, the coast of the, the edge of the world where giants live and stuff. It's not even a real place to most Romans and Greeks. Um, so when, when um, Julius Caesar, who is already a famous politician, right? He's al already a famous writer. He's al already a famous speaker. He's already the, the pontificate. He's already a religious leader because he was the pontificate's maximus. Uh, he's a war hero. as a successful general. He, he's, a, he's writing a diary saying about all the great things that he's done. And then he goes like to the moon, essentially, right? In addition to all the things he's already done, he takes his army and he goes to the edge of the world. And then he, he, um, he you know, visits the land of the giants and shows Roman power, even to them. And then he comes back to Rome, right? Just adding to his reputation as um, an incredibly powerful um, Roman figure, right? And that um, initiates the contact. And then about a hundred years later, a Roman emperor named Claudius decides that he's going to conquer um, the British Isles. And he sends an enormous, em em uh, he sends an enormous uh, army um, to um, England and he, uh, conquers the tribes sort of one by one he sort of some of them want to fight some of them want to make friends some of them are neutral but he plays the the tribes against each other he makes allies with some he tricks others it's actually not claudius himself it's his generals that do this but basically they gradually because the tribes never unify and have one big army to resist the the much more organized romans um conquer the, the, the entire um, area which will become England. They conquer it all the way up to Scotland where they get stopped by Scottish, um, the, they're not Scottish, but the people that lived in Scotland, they're not Scots yet, but the, the wild savage people in the mountains, um, the terrain and everything, they, they end up getting stopped sort of at the edge of where Scotland will, um, you know, establish its border in the future. And that's where we're gonna stop. <clears throat> we're gonna talk next class, uh, which will be recorded again. I'm going to talk about the whole first millennium um, from the Roman invasion uh, to 1066. So from about, you know, 55 AD or so, um, the first century AD, all the way up to William the Conqueror um, who is a sort of a French Viking who comes from Normandy, who conquers England a thousand years later. So next class, I'm gonna go through that the Romans, the Anglo-Saxons, the Germans who invade, um, I'm gonna talk about the Vikings and I'm gonna talk about the Normans. Those are the four major invasions um, that transform the culture of um, the Brit the English the British, eventually the British forever. So that's where we'll stop today. That's probably enough. Um, please watch both of these videos. Um, enjoy your holiday, as I said. Um, it only takes 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, this lecture also ended up being closer to 45 minutes. So don't worry about that. I know Wednesday is only supposed to be an hour, but uh, on Friday, it is Friday, and um, we're only supposed to have class for three hours. So um, every Friday, we're never gonna go all the way until one o'clock. I'll always let you go early. So if these lectures go over 30 minutes um, and you have to watch 15 minutes extra, um, don't be angry because I promise I will let you go early every Friday, okay? So we'll, we'll just take this time out of Friday's lecture so everybody's happy. Okay, thank you for listening. And like I said, I'll try and keep the lectures shorter, but uh, occasionally um, they may get closer to 45 minutes than, than to 30 when there's lots of things to explain. If you have any um, questions, you can email me or just wait until we go to class and you put your hand up 
and uh, ask me in class so I can give the answer to everybody at the same time. Thanks again for listening and uh, see you in a couple weeks.